Hello, and welcome to Book Break for Greece Public Library. I'm Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here. I moderate our Pints and Prose book discussion group, and I am joined, as always, by my colleague, Claire. Thank you, Kirstra. I am Claire, and I moderate the As the Page Turns and also our historical group on Facebook. Awesome. And today, we are back to bring you sort of a regular roundup of what we've been reading. It's been... Probably more than a month since we've done that, beginning right. of December, I think. Yeah, we we both have quite a few books, I think, that we've read that we can share and talk about today. Indeed. Um, well, Claire, why don't you get us started with one that you're particularly excited about? All right. Um, this was one that I was looking at, Olga Dies Dreaming. And um, I think you would like this one as well as a lot of other people. It is about a status-driven wedding planner. Um, it's 2017. We are set in Brooklyn, in uh, New York, and it's a very family-driven story with that has a lot of Puerto Rican roots. So we have um, the wedding planner Olga and her brother Pietro. Both of them are very successful. Um, he is a congress congressman for the district. So we're exploring various themes of gentrification of Brooklyn, and everyone has secrets to hide. Uh, Pietra has a very big secret that will come out, but he is also, because of this, on the take. So a lot of the decisions that he's making for the district are not really on the up and up, and his family does not know this. Meanwhile, both of them are suffering because their mother left abruptly. She is a very militant, pro-Puerto Rico freedom, and she elected to leave her children and pursue this dream of, of freedom for Puerto Rico, but it has really left them with a lot of scars in their own life. Their father, unfortunately, dealt with this with drug abuse and died. So there's some sadness, but there's also some happiness. There is a new relationship for the wedding planner who plans everyone's wedding but her own. Um, so it, it really was a really great book. I think it's been picked up to be on TV via some network. I can't think of which one right now. Oh, but right. Um, yeah, I really, really liked it. And it was a debut novel, which I always like. Yeah. So some of you may remember that that's, I think I talked about that one in our 2022 Yes, one preview. of us talked about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so I would just like to start out by saying kudos for getting right to that list <laughs> and having one that's not going to end up on your stack of shame. That's so right. Well, the only reason is I got it early in it. my book of the month club, so I can't <laughs> take too much credit for that. Uh, my daughter actually picked this one for our mother daughter read for December. Uh, and I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I, I would. Very so, nice. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm still looking forward to that one. Yeah, I'll lend you my copy. Um, so I will start. Uh, my first one, then, that I will talk about is Isabel Allende, A Long Petal of the Sea. Um, so this is one that's been sort of on my radar, but also was a reader recommendation in our comments on Facebook. So I was like, you know what, let me just go ahead and pick this up and see what I think. Um, and so this is a generational story. Um, we follow Victor and Roser, who are living in Barcelona during the Spanish Civil War, and they are eventually displaced mm -hmm. um, as Franco kind of sweeps in and clears everyone out. They escape to France um, and refugee camps there and then eventually make their way to Chile because apparently um, the poet Pablo Neruda, who was Chilean, um, was instrumental in getting this whole passenger ship called the SS Winnipeg. He helped 2,000 Spanish refugees migrate to Chile after, during and after the Spanish Civil War. I had no idea. Yeah. Not me either. It's fascinating. Apparently he was um, very political and involved in diplomacy and internal Chilean politics. I had no idea. Um, so that was an interesting like little historical aside. Um, and then we follow Victor and Roser as they sort of make a life together and establish themselves in this new country. And we follow them all the way from the 1930s up until the end of the 1980s. So quite quite a span. Um, 
there are lots of side characters and you get a lot of background on them. So the things that I liked about this book were how well um, kind of the rabbit holes that we went down for all of those different side characters and a ton of historical background. You can tell Isabel Allende did a huge amount of historical research to write this book. And it's about a topic I really knew very little about. And I always enjoy to read a book where I'm learning something new. Um, what I didn't love about this book was the actual writing. Um, I found, so, you know, there's the, the old adage um, for books and like movies and things that says show, don't tell. Mm -hmm. And I felt like this was a lot of telling and not a lot of showing. Okay. But if you go on Goodreads, there's like huge numbers of five-star reviews. So... I think this is definitely one where like your mileage may vary and just how you react to different sorts of framing of stories. Okay. Um, so the, the content I found fascinating, I just didn't love the actual way it was written. So. I do like when historical fiction makes me delve into reality and that is one of my favorite parts of that when somebody does their research and you can kind of springboard and learn about something mm -hmm. that you haven't before so Absolutely. and it's nice that it was a, a reader recommendation yeah. or a listener recommendation absolutely keep them coming please do yeah so I'm going to kind of talk about my next one which is the Magnolia Palace by Fiona Davis I'm just going really whole hog heavy on my <laughs> Book of the Month Club picks here. Can you just hold it like more in the center, pl closer to your mic? To my mic? There you go, perfect. Okay. So um, this is one, it was really funny because when my daughter and I were picking our January picks, I, I picked another one um, that I'll talk about another time. But she was like, Mom, you're not picking the Magnolia Palace that has Mama written all over it. And I was like... Yeah, you know what? Let's do that one, too. So we did two this month. But anyway, the Magnolia Palace, which is interesting. If you've ever read anything by Fiona Davis, she picks a historic building in New York City, like an actual building. She's done the Dakota. She's done the New York Public Library. Um, this one is the, the Frick Mansion, which is a art museum. Okay, that's why it sounds And she familiar. does a dual story timeline. So she has like an old historic story and then a more modern one. And sometimes I enjoy them more than I, I thought, you know, but other ones I haven't enjoyed quite so much. So this one I actually really liked. And it, it has to do with two models. The, the first one, it was considered New York's first supermodel because she was the person that was the muse for many of the famous sculptures in New York City, including the one that is on top of the Fisk Mansion like entryway. And the interesting thing is, is when I started to look into who this was, it is um, a real model named Audrey Munson, and she was born right here in Racha Cha. What? Yeah, in 1891. So, um, and she had a scandalous life to boot. One of the parts in the in the historical story is she is sprung to a new life when her mother, A, dies of Spanish flu, and she was accused of possibly being involved in a murder because her landlord was obsessed with her. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she she ran off. So in the that actually did happen in real life. She was huh. cleared, but she never really got over that. Um, but in, in this story, she runs away, and then finds herself outside of the, the Fist's mansion, who, incidentally, his daughter is looking for a personal secretary. So, voila! Um, she happens to know a lot about art, because having worked with so many sculptures, she's quite well-versed in the art world. And they are looking for someone to help with the cataloging and different things. But... Mr. Fisk is one of the most hated men in New York because he was in charge of a coal company in Pennsylvania. The Johnstown flood was partially kind of blamed on him because they didn't really make repairs to the dam, you know, because they were too busy buying millions of dollars worth of art. <laughs> um, but he wanted to have his home later turned into a museum and his daughter 
was involved with that. So it's it's a lot of family, once again, family secrets and so forth, and, and a murder possibly at the end. Uh, the modern story is set in like the 60s. It's a young British model who was trying to break onto the scene, and there's a Vogue shooting at that mansion. Um, she and the photographer disagree, and then she is trapped in the mansion during a snowstorm, and then a young... Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> a young intern is also trapped there. Um, and they start to, to find there's like a, a mystery of a missing diamond. So it's kind of hokey, but it was a lot of fun. And mm -hmm. I, I read it and uh, really liked it. And I would love to start to visit some of these places now that I know a little bit more background. So that is the one good thing I can say about Fiona Davis's books. Mm. Um, and we read the one about the Dakota from my As the Page Turns book club, and ironically, two of my members went to New York City. So they went and found, like, the John Lennon, you know, the Strawberry Fields mm -hmm. Garden and some things that were mentioned in the book, and they went to the Dakota. So I, I was pretty... Oh, cool. Yeah, I thought that was cool. Yeah. Um, did she write, is it uh, the masterpiece? Is that one that you yes. talked about? Yep, yep. Before? Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, she's got a whole like shelf oh yeah pretty <laughs> much yeah section. she's probably read any of hers this is probably one of like her at least fourth or fifth book i'm okay. thinking yeah hmm. nice so. well that sounds very interesting yeah so very cool a little hometown connection yeah that was a <laughs> surprise so. yeah um well i am also going to do one with a hometown connection next and that is Cackle. Cackle. By Rachel Harrison. <laughs> so this is Rachel Harrison's second book. She is actually a local author, um, grew up elsewhere, and now lives in the Rochester area. So keep an eye out for Rachel Harrison. Um, so this one, the main our main character is Annie. Um, Annie lives in New York City with her boyfriend, Sam. They've been together forever. They share an apartment, and they've been together for, like, six or eight years and when the book opens Annie has just been dumped <laughs> oh she was expecting a proposal and she did not get one <laughs> uh oh so yikes and because it's New York she and her boyfriend are still cohabitating because she can't afford to move out on her own so it's just all around a terrible situation and she realizes that she can't stay in New York like she can't afford to live on her own She's a teacher, so she takes a teaching job upstate. So she's moving upstate. She ends up in this beautiful, picturesque little upstate village in this perfect little apartment, and she doesn't know anyone, and she's just kind of, you know, wallowing in her own <laughs> misery until she meets Sophie, who is um, a longtime resident of the town, kind of mysterious, totally magnetic, like mm -hmm. one of these women who just seems to have, like, everything put together kind of effortlessly. She takes Annie under her wing and, you know, um, spends time with her and tries to help her, you know, find her feet. Um, and, you know, maybe Annie just kind of ignores the fact that everyone in town seems like the tiniest bit terrified of Sophie. We don't really know why. <laughs> That's not a good sign. No. And maybe her perfect apartment has like a slight spider infestation but you know not to worry everything else is great uh -oh. it's fine so <laughs> you can kind of see a little bit where this is going um she's a witch <laughs> she might be a witch <laughs> she might be a witch um so it's a witchy book it is kind of spooky but it's not a scary book mm -hmm. at all um atmospheric if anything. So um, I could handle this book? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and it's actually surprisingly funny okay. in a lot of parts. So it's kind of like a, a cozy horror. Okay. <laughs> you know, there's cozy mystery. That, Why that's not? about my speed. Why not cozy horror? Yeah. Um, but the one thing that I will say is that the ending goes in a direction I did not expect and really kind of made the book for me. So... You're, you know, trucking along with Annie like, oh, girl, watch yourself. You're, you're getting into something you don't, you don't really understand. And you think you know exactly where it's going to go and how it's going to end up. And then there's just kind of a left turn at the end. And I was like, oh, I like it. 
So a little bit of a surprise ending that really kind of tied it up with a bow for me. Um, so Cackle by local author Rachel Harrison. Her first book, um, her debut, I've also read. It's called The Return. And that one is like horror. It's not It's not cozy horror. It's just straight on horror. horror. Yeah. Um, but this one is a little cozier and a little more fun. So. That one sounds more my speed. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Real horror, not so much. <laughs> All right, my last one, I don't have the actual book, but I believe you talked about this one, The Maid mm -hmm. by Nita Prose. This one I would classify as a cozy mystery. It's a little bit different because it gave me vibes, I think I said, about the, the dog in the nighttime mm -hmm. because The Maid, Molly Gray, is definitely somewhere on the spectrum. And that was the only thing I really didn't love about this because they make her have weaknesses like for the ability to discern like people's motivations, but yet she's extremely smart otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I just haven't interacted with enough people to know how accurate the, her portrayal was. Got it. But um, she's she absolutely loves her job. She's a little obsessive about cleaning. And her grandmother died, so she's really working hard. She's trying to maintain her apartment. She's made some kind of not-so-great moves with people, like trusting and losing money and so forth. Um, so she's kind of got her back up against the wall as far as her apartment and being able to survive on her own. So her day is upended when she goes into clean a room and finds the wealthiest patron at this hotel is dead. Uh oh, very much so. Um, so she's of course questioned by the police, and you're trying to figure out this story and what happened. Come to find out, there's very nefarious activity that's happening at this hotel, and you really want to. I wanted to shake Molly at times and say, <laughs> "Molly, girl, get your <laughs> act together." Um, but she was not having any of my stuff. You know, she's just blindly going into these relationships uh, that were not good. But she does turn it around. Um, there is a doorman who was friends with her grandmother that ends up helping her when she, you know, starts to get herself to the point where they actually think she may have committed the murder or been involved. Um, so she starts putting on her sleuthy, you know, clue shoes and finding out who did it and getting enlisting help so that they can solve this mystery. Clue um, shoes is my new favorite phrase. Okay. Okay. So Let's all put on our clue shoes. Yes. A lot of people on Goodreads found it very heartwarming because it does tie up very neatly. Like mm. she's really looking for someone to have a relationship with. And, you know, be, she just has a lot of trouble with that. But she does find someone in the end. I don't want to give too much away. It, it, it does set off Claire's implausibility, implausibility meter a little bit, you know, with how neatly it was tied up and how happy everyone is. Um, because I'm just a witch that doesn't believe in any of that stuff. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. But it, it really was fun. It was entertaining. And once I started reading, and I do notice it's picked for Good Morning America. So, you know, there's, there's a book group now for everybody, that I've found. That is true. Yeah. Greece Public Library offers several quality book groups. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. That's true. Nice. Um, well, that works out really well because my last book is a little bit of a mystery, too. And it is, let's see, The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. And this is actually one of Claire's teen books. Yeah. That, um, that one is is very popular. That was is it? like on my list of I always do research as to mm -hmm. what are the most popular books in teen, and that one was definitely within the top twenty checkouts of this year. Well, look at me with my finger on the teen pulse. I tell you, <laughs> it's impressive. Who knew? Um, so I actually found this one um, scrolling through what's available now in Libby. Mm -hmm. um, I needed a new audiobook, and I landed on this, and I was like, oh, this seems fun. Let's let's see. And it is so much fun. It is so much fun. It's the first in a planned trilogy. Uh, the second book just came out. I'm like, 90% through the second book oh, right wow. now, um, which is called The Hawthorne Legacy. Mm -hmm. And the third book, I think, is due out either late this year or early next year. Um, so 
there is hope for all of us who have been burned by incomplete series. <laughs> I'm looking at you, George R. R. Martin, <laughs> forever. Um, but anyway, back to the book. So our setup here is our protagonist is Avery Grams. Um, she is 16 or 17, living in Connecticut, suburban Connecticut, um, and she is not having a great time of it. Her mother has just passed away from cancer. Um, her older half-sister is her legal guardian, but she may or may not be kind of living out of her car. Oh. Like, it's not a great situation for Avery. Um but she's just like keeping her head down and concentrating on graduating high school and getting into college to study actuarial science so that she can go do math and be an actuary. Like this is this is her dream. Like this is her goal. It, um, it is a very good income stream from what I've heard. So. Right. Exactly. So our um, big plot twist comes when Avery finds out that she has been named in a will uh, the will of Tobias Hawthorne, uh, notorious Texas billionaire. Uh-oh. Who she has never met, has barely even heard of, um, but she has to go fly to Texas for the reading of this will. And when she gets there, she finds out that not only is she named in this will, uh, Tobias Hawthorne has basically left her his entire estate and disinherited all of his other family. Oh, nice. <laughs> Indeed. So there's like... <laughs> Uh, there are four grandsons, um, close in age to Avery, uh, who, you know, really stood to inherit the bulk of the estate and basically got nothing. And then there are various aunts and uncles in the picture. Um, but in order to actually get this inheritance, Avery has to spend the next year living at Hawthorne House, um, which is Tobias Hawthorne's giant crazy mansion out in Texas. So she has to live there for a year and the rest of the family is allowed to stay living there as well. <laughs> so she just gets thrown into this family um, incre of incredible wealth. Um, and once she gets there, she finds out like she's, she has no idea still why she was named in this will, why she inherited. The family is like, who is this interloper trying to steal our fortunes, right? Um, but then they start to find clues, and it turns out that Tobias Hawthorne was a huge fan of puzzles and used to set uh, puzzles and riddles for his grandsons to solve, so they're all, you know, used to this. Um, and there's sort of the idea that if they solve the riddle, this puzzle, they'll find out why Avery was in the will. So it's a little bit of the Westing game, if you read The Westing Game way mm -hmm. back in the day, I feel like I'm dating myself incredibly with that reference. <laughs> but, like, The Westing Game and Knives Out had a baby, and okay. that baby is this book. Um, there are probably a lot of things in here that are going to make Claire's implausibility meter just, I, like, I was going to say, can we just the cut to the, to the chase end? and do a DNA swab? And <laughs> well, sure. <laughs> I mean, that does come up. I am no fun. Yeah, <laughs> I know. But, um... So, like, don't look too closely behind the curtain. <laughs> um, but it is a lot of fun along the way. So it's it's a page turner, um, huge amount of fun, very entertaining. Well, who hasn't wanted to, like, be named in a will like that? And exactly. Yeah, get a huge yeah. estate. Yeah. Nice. Exactly. So that's uh, that's what I've got for okay. today. Okay. Um, we should also mention, as we wrap up, that if you have managed to miss it somehow by living under a rock, our Grease Reads author for 2022 has been announced. Um, Claire, do you want to tell us a little bit about yes. our book and our author? It is Etoff Rum, who is a Palestinian-American author. This is her debut novel. It is called A Woman Is No Man. I read it with As the Page Turns. They really enjoy discussing that book. I think Kirstra is reading it with her book club next month. And we're also doing a big discussion on March 14th, 14th I, think. I think. It's a think. It's a Monday in March, and it's at Blue Barn Cidery. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to have the author here on the 24th. So we have copies here. It's also available on Hoopla in both audio and ebook. So read with us. And come and see the author. She'll sign books. 
So Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So you can register for the author visit and the big book discussion right on our website on the calendar. Um, so if you ever listen to book break or watch book break and think, I have opinions about that, I would like to share or I have a question and I want to see what other people think, then you should come to the big book discussion. Yeah. Um, it is open to anyone who has read the book. Um, so read a copy of the book, come and join us. And did uh, did we mention that you can get cider and possibly yeah, food? Maybe. So you oh can yeah, get cider at Blue Barn Cidery. It's kind of what they do. Yeah, it'll be it's so fun. much fun. Um, so join us for that, and then join us for the author visit. We're super excited that this is going to be our first in person Grease Reads after two years of Zoom related, right. COVID related yeah. <laughs> events. Darn you, COVID! <laughs> I know. So. Um, yeah, so find that right on our website um, or ask here at the library. Any of us would be happy to help you sign up or find a copy of the book. Yes, and also we are just starting our book challenge. Yes. So we have a display up. Mm -hmm. Kirsten, do you want to tell them a little yeah. bit more about Perfect Pairs? Our theme is Perfect Pairs. <laughs> and we may or may not have picked that theme just so that we could have The pairs. little pairs. <laughs> Just saying. Um, so the idea with this challenge is it's not about reading books in a certain category. It's about reading pairs of books. So we want you to choose a fiction and a nonfiction that are related in some way. So it could be, um, you know, we've got Fiona Davis with her um, book about the Frisk. Fisk? Frisk House? Fisk House? Yeah. That's the one I just read. Yes, I know. Sorry, I was asking for you to correct me on the name of the museum, <laughs> the house. <laughs> I'll have to we'll anyway. look at my notes because now I'm anyway. all befuddled. No, that's all right. Yeah. Um, so you could Frick. read Frick, Frick Mansion. House. Frick yeah. Mansion. So you could read uh, the Fiona Davis book and then read a nonfiction book about the actual Frick Mansion. Mm -hmm. And, um, or you could read, you know, we've got A Long Petal of the Sea about the Spanish Civil War, about Chile. So you could read this one and then a nonfiction book about any topic that relates. Um, and then we just have a little form for you to fill out where you tell us what books you read and why you put them together and what you got from that. So, um, And then, of course, we're going to draw prizes from, from the, the people that turn in their forms. Yeah, so, so. everyone who submits um, an entry form talking about a pair of books that they've read will be eligible or some sort of prize drawing at the end of the program. So more information on that is available at the library. We also have, as Claire mentioned, a display where we have prepared some books for you. So if you're a little stumped about where to start, we have some books already set up in little pairs that you can check right out. So. And that challenge is going to run through the end of May. Right. So you have plenty of time. Yes. No excuses, people. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's what we've got today. So thank you all for joining us. Please do let us know in the comments on Facebook if you have read any of the books that we talked about today, what you thought about them, or what else you might be reading these days. Yes. All right. And we'll be back, let's see, at the beginning of February. And we will see you then. Take care. <laughs> Happy reading. Happy reading. <laughs>